Hi there, and welcome to Atomic Theory. Now this video is going to be a little bit different from most of the ones be that we see, because in this video, all we're really doing is getting a, a lot of the background information taken care of, so that we can move on to the theory that we'll actually be using in class. So Atomic Theory has been a very long learning process for mm, scientists in general, and we're going to take a look at that learning so that we can understand how we got to where we're going to be for this course. So we want to start with understanding what we mean by theory. So if there's two things that we claim that we know. There's observable things, or sometimes called empirical knowledge, where I know that, uh, well, my shirt is blue. I know that there's, you know, two feet in my, you know, in my shoes. That made no sense. And then there's also theoretical knowledge. And these are things that we don't actually know for sure, oops, back that one, where we don't actually know for sure, so we have to come up with a theory to explain it. And then we'll often accept that theory as workable and useful. Not necessarily the same thing as true, although we use it if, as if it were. So a theory, then, is a set of statements that describes or explains and predicts. And that's really, really important for us to understand. It's not necessarily correct. We actually don't know what atoms really look like because we've never seen them. So we can't observe that knowledge. So what we do is we come up with ideas that explain that, you know, hey, this would explain what I'm observing. And then we say, would also predict that this would happen. And if that happens, we say that, yay, that theory is still usable. Well then, because atoms are too small to be seen, we'll generate models, things that we can handle or draw to say this is what the atom looks like. And then it's not really important, but we also have laws. We're not really going to deal with that uh, in this course so much. And when we do, yeah, but that's what a law is. So it all starts with a man named Democritus, or Democritus, if you prefer. We don't know how he pronounced his name. Uh, I've heard Democritus more often than Democritus. So we'll call him Democritus. And Democritus might have looked like that. I don't know, it's a statue I found that said it was him. And Democritus said this. You don't need to write it down, but I want you to kind of look at what he's coming up with. He's saying that everything is made of atoms. And uh, he actually had a different word, but I've paraphrased a little bit. He said that they're indestructible particles. He said that they are unique to their, their own uh, identity, and that from one to the next, they're going to be different. So his model for that was to look, draw atoms that look like this. And what you'll notice is that the water atoms are round, so they'll flow, they'll roll. And hey, water does that. If you swirl water around, it swirls around. Uh, iron, on the other hand, he's got these hooks and, and things drawn in there. So those iron atoms are going to hold on to each other really tightly. And if you think about what we know about iron, it's a very hard material. So his model and his theory kind of did kind of explain some observations. And then there was Aristotle. And Aristotle, Aristotle needs a couple of pupils. That actually doesn't help. But Aristotle rejected the idea of atoms, and he th said that it was more about qualities of things. So he developed a separate theory that said that everything was made up of earth, air, fire, and water. And his model then was able to explain certain things. And his, well, I don't know, periodic table would look something like this. But without going into it in detail, he was able to explain certain observable things with his theory. So his theory, in some cases, worked. Well, let's jump ahead in history and get all the way up to uh, the early 1800s with John Dalton. And that's John Dalton there. I'm not sure what's in his ear, but that's OK. And John Dalton had a theory that was based on experimental. So not just observable things, but experimental evidence as well, which is a little bit more, uh, more stronger. Stronger? More stronger. A little bit stronger. We'll go with that. He said that atoms were hard, indestructible spheres. We're almost back to Democritus, except for Dalton's now saying that all atoms are spheres. And that all atoms of one atom, one kind of atom, are exactly alike in all respects. But then they're also going to be different from 
atoms of a different kind. So gold atoms are gold atoms, and every single gold atom is exactly the same. And oxygen atoms are oxygen atoms, and they're exactly the same in, in all respects, but they're different from gold. So it's about that. And then he also then started talking about compounds, so that water was not a unique atom, like Democritus thought, but it was a, com a combination of atoms. So we have now, uh, that's where we get the experimental evidence into it. So his uh, model looked like this, hard and indestructible spheres. And you've seen pictures like this a lot of times, and for some things we will still use that. It's a pretty good model for some things. Well then along comes William Crookes, and William Crookes had an awesome mustache. But he also invented something called the Crookes tube, because he named it after himself. Uh, he didn't call it the... Uh, and the Crookes tube made cathode rays, and the basic structure of a Crookes tube looked like this, and I'll show you a better picture uh, in class. What you have there is a glass tube with electrodes in it, and then high voltage electricity. And when you turned it on, when you passed electricity through this, you got this beam of light that traveled through the tube. And what you end up with was straight lines starting from the cathode, so it's cathode, and rays, that's the ray, and it was a glass tube. tube. But more important than that, they found some of the properties of these cathode rays. And you can see those here. And what that suggested was that the thing that made up the cathode ray uh, had mass and it had a charge. And that got people thinking. And there's a couple of other pictures of cathode ray tubes. And no, you don't need to write those down. J.J. Thompson, a few years later, came along not a bad mustache. And he then started studying those cathode rays and made by Crookes tubes in a little bit more detail, and he tried to explain that. And his uh, explanation is that those things, the cathode rays, were actually made of electrons. And that then the electrons came from the atoms. So he took those hard indestructible spheres and he put electrons in them. So now he had to change the model. And you've heard the raisin bun model or plum pudding model or something like that. But you had this sphere of positive charge with the negative ch negatively charged electrons in it. And then Ernest Rutherford came along. And you've probably heard of Ernest Rutherford, and that's what he looks like. And it looks like he came along after color photography came around. But Ernest Rutherford, who worked with J.J. Thompson, did the gold foil experiment. And the gold foil experiment, we took, uh, we, he took um, alpha particles, okay, radioactive particles, and shot it at a very, very thin sheet of gold foil. He thought this was going to happen, that the gold atoms looked like that, these big raisin buns, and the small radioactive particles were going to fly right through. So he pretty much expected to have uh, what you see running the straight line from that box all the way to the end. But what he actually got was the scattering of particles all around. So his prediction was his results. Now, with the results, he's, we've already got a new model. And that new model is the, um, well, let's go with the key conclusions first, that the atom has a small uh, concentration of mass. So a lot of mass in small space. And that the electrons that are around the nucleus. So instead of the electrons being embedded into the atom, they're around the atom. So then we got the planetary model of the atom. So his key conclusions, go back to that, led to the new model. Now you're probably familiar with that, and we'll actually uh, take that one step further into what's called the Bohr atom by Niels Bohr, and again, you've heard of, of that, I'm sure. But what we'll do is that will be our starting point. So we've got all this background, and now we're going to look at what did Bohr use to develop his atom, and that'll be what we do in class. And we'll talk to you then. See you later.